Uh, welcome everyone to Beaconsfield podcast. I'm immensely honoured here today to be speaking with such an accomplished and globally respected historian and writer. Linda Colley is the Shelby M.C. Davis 1958 Professor of History at Princeton University and a Fellow of both the British Academy and Swedish Collegium for Advanced Study. Her seven books include Britain's Winner of the Wolfson Prize, The Ordeal of Elizabeth Marsh, a New York Times Top 10 Book of the Year, and Acts of Union and Disunion, based on a series of talks commissioned by BBC Radio 4. She divides her time between the USA and Europe, where she now joins us from Berlin. So thank you so much, Professor Colley, um, for coming on this morning and speaking with me. So the book we're going to be discussing today is your latest um, edition. It's The Gun, the Ship and the Pen, Warfare Constitutions and the Making of the Modern World. So I recommend that everyone buys this. Um, but it's really a book that explores written constitutions from the 18th, 19th and 20th centuries and how their proliferation, distribution and meaning has been shaped by hybrid warfare. Um, I thought we'd start with a kind of biographical note, Professor Colley, because as someone born in the United Kingdom, a place without a written constitution, um, you write that you came to this subject as an outsider. So what was your relationship with written constitutions before writing this book? Um, and did that relationship change during the course of writing it? Well, I suppose before coming to the United States, um, I didn't really have a relationship with written constitutions. I knew they existed, of course. But one of the reasons why I wrote this book was that constitutional history, certainly in the UK, but in other countries too, used to be a very big subject in history departments, not just in political science and law departments. Uh, and certainly in Britain, um, up to the 1950s, even into the 1960s, you might learn something about constitutional history in school, uh, certainly if you studied history in one of the big universities or even one of the smaller ones, you, you likely do something about constitutions. But by the time I got processed through the educational system, certainly when I started my historical training, um, constitutional history had just been let go. It was seen as very fusty, very arid. Um, and it just came to be monopolized by legal scholars, by political scientists, who were often interested in one particular set of questions, um, the evolution of democratic constitutionalism. Uh, so there was often a kind of teleological mm. bent to how that subject was studied. So moving to the United States, encountering a place where not only was, was there a sort of national codified constitution, but all the state constitutions, and this cult that had evolved around these kind of texts, made me think about them more. And I started reading up and thinking, well, you know, all these legal scholars, they're asking good questions, it's all very learned, I'm, I'm getting a lot. But as a historian, this is not the whole story. Mm. Uh, and I wanted to write about constitutions in continental, transnational ways. And I wanted to point out that constitutions had always, these kind of constitutions, had always been about much more than democracy and sometimes not really about democracy at all. Mm. Which brings us then to, I guess, the central thesis of your book is really in the title, isn't it? The gun, the ship and the pen. Um, just for the sake of our, of our listeners, it would be wonderful, Professor, if you could just tell us what you found um, when you actually ventured into that story, what the relationship between warfare constitutions and particularly written constitutions was. Well, it seemed to me as I looked at this story that there were a lot more constitutions around than people had re registered, mm. partly because some of the constitutions 
did not suit this kind of democratic preconception. But also when I looked at constitutions, how they had emerged, particularly for the first time in different parts of the world, the connection with warfare, some kind of existential crisis that a society was going through, uh, and how very often this was the boost to the first adoption of a codified constitution, some kind of, as I say, existential crisis. And indeed, um, perversely, that also obtains in Britain. Um, but at an earlier period, it mm. was the outbreak of massive civil warfare in England, spreading into Ireland and Scotland and Wales in the 1640s and 50s, that for the first and only time in that society resulted in a brief codified constitution, the so-called instrument of government of 1653. Now, it didn't last, mm. but I think one of the reasons why my country of birth, Britain, has not had a codified constitution. There are many reasons, but one reason is that these kind of existential crises hadn't really happened since, well, 1688, I suppose, big invasion mm. by the Dutch, but no successful foreign invasion of Great Britain after that, no major revolution, no major civil war. Now, Ireland has a different story, but in terms of Great Britain, after these 17th century shocks, mm. there's nothing comparable after. And that is one reason, I think, why uh, one doesn't get a codified constitution at the moment in the UK. Right. So I guess the idea behind that is that these written constitutions then are attempts to stabilize unstable political social orders. Um, and that's that's probably where the hybrid warfare slash revolutionary uh, point comes in. It, one of the really fascinating things about your book is that it's, it's a truly global history and it's stunning when you read it um, because each place flows into the other seamlessly um, in the way that you craft it. Um, but one of the key case studies that you pull out early on in the book is the case of Corsica. Um, and you look at, you ask this question, why Corsica at, why at this point in time did they seek a, a written constitution? Um, I wonder if you could just describe what the crisis was in the case of Corsica that led someone like, you know, Pasquale Paoli to come in and, and try and establish a written constitution to stabilize this confusion, this crisis. Yeah, I mean, one of the really intriguing things I found writing this book was how often small places produced really radical, significant <laughs> documents in the constitutional line. And Corsica was a case in point. Um, Corsica in the mid 1750s, technically it's still a colony of mm. Genoa, the Genoan Republic in the Italian peninsula as it was then. Um, but Genoan power was weakening um, France was looking at Corsica very greedily. Um, Corsica itself was bitterly divided between contending power blocks. And this extraordinary man, Paoli, who has a background uh, in Corsica, comes back in 1755 and drafts a constitution that autumn. Uh, in which he tries to reorganize a free Corsican state that will be able to defend itself, that will be united, and where um, all men over the age of 25 will have the right to vote, and the right to become members of the legislature if they're elected in return for military service. It's a very 
it, it's at one and the same time both a militarized and a, a remarkably democratic vision as far mm. as males are concerned. The, and the connection for Pauli is a very clear one. He's got to work out how to defend the island and unite it. And for him, one way you do that is that you enfranchise most adult males. You give them a stake in the country in return for their having uh, defense duties. Um, mm. And this is the theme of the written constitution he produces in 1755. Mm. Um, because Corsica is uh, a poor place, there's no printing presses till 1760. Uh, and his original document doesn't survive. We've only got copies. But it's a remarkable document. And you can see there right at the start of what becomes a much faster growth of these kind of constitutions thereafter. You can mm. see right from the start the link between issues of warfare, issues of existential challenge, and um, in this case, a revolutionary of a sort wanting to draft a new founding document. Yeah, right. So it's an attempt to say, if you if you give us your military capacity, we'll give you voting rights. Um, and it's almost like a, a practical compact, isn't it? Is yeah, that and, and of course, it's very gendered. Um, yes. And this is going to be a continuing theme until, yes. in most places, not all, until the First World War, that precisely yes. because of this link that, that can go back to classical times, uh, mm. Uh, Pauli has certainly uh, read up on uh, some of the Greek and Roman classics and this idea of um, links between citizenship and um, a commitment to fight uh, mm. is one that he and others find in the classics, but he's, he's in he's interpreting it rather differently in classical times. Um, citizenship was a status of a particular class of male, and it brought with it the commitment to fight if need be. Here, it's rather different. Um, he's saying almost that if you are willing to fight and able to fight, then you can become a citizen. Uh, and that's a, that's a something of a shift from the ancient classical position. Um, but you get that mode of thinking uh, recurring in the late 18th century and in the long 19th century. Yeah, to stick with this very interesting um, gendered point, um, you know, you've got this wonderful chapter where you discuss how um, women and uh, you know, minorities like people of color as well as indigenous peoples often experienced written constitutions in such a way that walked back their rights. Um, and you use the example of Pitcan under Russell Elliott um, and how women's rights, citizenship rights um, were advanced with a written constitution there, but not at the kind of other major um, epicenters of the world where warfare was the case. Could you please just unpack that a little bit? Because that tells us a story too, doesn't it? Yeah, it's a bit of a freaky story. Um, yeah. I wanted to talk a lot about the Pacific world in this book because it, it is often left out of the constitutional story um, and it, it fits in in so many ways. Um, Pitcairn, this tiny South Pacific uh, islet, um, which had been settled by um, the mutineers from the bounty, those that um, mm. had uh, basically shacked up with Tahitian women, wanted to escape the wrath of the Royal Navy. So they settled this, this rocky island <laughs> in the Pacific, Pitcairn. Um, and by the 1830s, there's about 100 of these people. 
mm. mainly non-white uh, because the white males die off quite quickly. So it's their mixed race children with the Tahitian women that uh, colonized the island. There's only about a hundred plus of them by the 1830s. Wow. Um, and this Royal Naval captain arrives in the late 1830s and uh, talks to them and the islanders say, look, this is really difficult because we're getting American whalers landing and they want to take over the island and uh, <laughs> take up possessions and they don't have much. And Captain Elliot, who's clearly something of a belated enlightenment man, <laughs> drafts them a constitution and it's a remarkable document it it, it keeps going till the 1920s before it's amended wow. and it's remarkable in two ways it's remarkable in that he really worries about the environment which given that there isn't much environment in Pitcairn he has to do so there's <laughs> rules about how many trees you can cut down protecting rare birds how you should keep your goats. Mm. There's rules about educating humans. Mm. Education is compulsory. Um, but the most radical thing is he says, uh, all residents, male and female, after a certain age, have the vote um, for the head of the island. And that's what happens. Um, and early giving of women's franchise happens in other parts of the Pacific too. Mm. Uh, New Zealand would be a case in point at the end of the 19th century. But there's, as far as I know, there is no other site in the world other than Pitcairn where women get the vote so early, the 1830s, and keep the vote yeah that says said you wouldn't i think want to live on pitcairn island certainly if you were <laughs> female um you weren't necessarily very well treated but you yeah. did have the vote yeah and i guess the shadow side of that freaky story is that you know the bigger nations weren't doing the same so they were doing what you spoke about where they were entrenching or I think the word that you use is amplifying existing inequalities, um, which pushes back against this teolo teleological conception of written constitutions as something that always enhance democratic participation and rights. Is that correct? Well, it, it can do. It um, can do, yeah. Because certainly in the settlement areas, um, the United States, hmm. um, Australia, New Zealand, South Africa, uh, but also in areas of uh, Russian expansion into Central Asia, mm. um, you, you see this determination to take land at the expense of indigenous people. And that therefore, even when constitutions are adopted, which in other ways are quite democratic. So for example, Australia is uh, the first mm. place to make um, the secret ballot compulsory in elections in the 1850s, which is obviously a good thing. Again, it's only for men, mm. but there's a feeling that Indigenous people anyway are on their way out. Um, they're going to die off. And very often you help them do that. Um, but that they are not part of the modern state. Mm. Uh, and that this is just, I mean, some people regret this, but they just say, well, look, you know, the growth of uh, advanced democratic state means male voting, ideally all male voting, but not women and not indigenous people because they're different. Mm. Uh, and so 
every time uh, in the United States and, and ideas about voting between Australia and the United States are constantly flowing um, across each other. But every time a new state is created in the United States, eventually it will get its own state constitution. Uh, this happens in California in the late 1840s. Mm. Uh, and these state constitutions, these spreading state constitutions westward in the United States can be very democratic for white males, but often indigenous people are pushed out. Um, and, and this tends to be the case from 1787, the discussions mm. in Philadelphia, where there's, the line is taken, look, Native Americans, we probably won't tax them because they're not citizens. Um, and because they're not citizens, they get left out of constitutions. Well, you know, you could argue, well, that's all right. They didn't have to pay taxes, did they? So they got something, but not really, because it meant that when white males stole the land mm -hmm. and pushed these people around, they were shut off from the political processes. Mm -hmm. And as an Australian, you know, reading that part of your book, I found really surprising. Um, and again, a, free, a freaky story of its own, you know, the story of um, Sir George Gipps, one of our governors of New South Wales, where I am now, um, yeah. using legal and constitutional arguments and justifications from the United States for the exclusion of Indigenous peoples from, um, from democratic participation in Australia here. So, so it gets again to a you know, one of the theses of your book, which is that these ideas travel around the world and they can be used um, depending on the whim and will of the person in, in whose hands they lie in whatever particular country they find themselves at work. It's, um, and this was the central tension, Professor, that I had in my mind reading your book was that between innovation, so the creation of written constitutions um, as an exportable political technology, and this idea of honouring the existing political consensus, social norms and manners of a place in particular as shaped by its history. Um, you know, I'm a Burkean and this is what I'm always sort of thinking about, but be, it would be interesting to un, un, unpack this. Um, let's start with Thomas Paine because there's an interesting profile that you provide of, of Thomas Paine in which you say that he thought a constitution was only legitimate if it was a written one, if it was visible. Um, at the same time, he thought that one needed to draw on the ancient liberties um, available to them in, in the histories text offered up to them, say, in England. Um, why did Thomas Paine think that a written constitution had to be written? Um, why did he think that was essential to innovation? Well, I think there's a personal reason. Um, his grandfather on his mother's side um, had been town clerk of Thetford, the Norfolk village where Payne was mm. born. Um, and one duty of town clerks in England at that time and earlier was to look after local charters. Um, and I should say the relationship between written charters and written constitutions is a close and interesting one in mm. Anglo regions of the world and not just those regions, in fact. And so I think uh, as a child, um, given his family members, uh, Payne would have thought about written documents influencing local government. And mm. so that's one aspect. Also, Payne grew up and spent a lot of time, all, all, all his time until his 30s, living in England. He was caught up with a lot of radical movements there. And some of these radical movements were trying to justify their arguments by reinterpreting Magna Carta. Mm. Um, and some of them were sort of claiming, well, you know, actually Magna Carta was a constitution. Um, and uh, it's more important, therefore, than parliament. 
because constitutions are laws that cannot be altered by the legislature. They, they have prime status. Um, so Payne is playing around with these ideas even before the American Revolution. Uh, and of course, once you get to the mid 1770s, Payne, who's fed up with Britain, um, sees he's going nowhere there, emigrates to Philadelphia, and then gets caught up in the onset of the American Revolution. And for him, the shift is an easy one um, because he is fed up with Britain. And so he adopts this new identity as an American. Uh, but also he sees a place where written constitutions can evolve in new ways while drawing on old traditions because the American colonies too had had charters. So for Payne, hey, you know, here's a, a, another test case where we can move from old charters to new constitutions. Mm. And this time, much more exciting new constitutions made possible by the American Revolution. I see, right. So, I mean, un underlying that thinking is the idea that you can make a modern state. It's something that you can create. Um, I think one of the words that the French revolutionaries use, which you point to in your book, is fix a constitution. Um, do you think that that way of thinking about written constitutions was helpful for the places that you examined in your in your book? Or um, if it was, why? Um, and if it had a negative consequence or negative consequences, what, what do you think they were? I think in many societies, however radical the crisis is, there's often an instinct among some activists and legislators to mingle the past with what is new, mm. uh, even if they're borrowing ideas from other places, as most constitution writers are you often get activists saying, well, yes, we're borrowing that from America, from France, from Norway, from, or from the Dutch or whatever, but um, we also want to, in our new constitution, acknowledge local customs and conventions. So the Norwegian constitution of 1814, which is the second oldest constitution that still survives after that of the United States. Um, the Norwegians, again, they're in an existential crisis. They expect Sweden to invade. They want to draft their political constitution in 1814 before the Swedish army arrives. They've mm. only got a few weeks to do it. So they're borrowing from a lot of other constitutions. <laughs> um, in some cases, whole paragraphs because wow. you know they've got to work at speed. But one of the things they do, for example, is stress the importance and the ancientness of their monarchy. Um, they want that in. And so one of the words that comes up a lot in the 1814 Norwegian constitution is king. Mm. Um, and that's their way of saying, well, yes, we borrowed, of course, it's been an emergency, but we are holding true to past traditions in that respect. Yeah, because this is this one, another thing that I found interesting was the, Mie the Meiji constitution of 1889, um, which you unpacked too. And, one of the things with that constitution is it is this intricate attempt to balance the past with the future in a continuous way. Um, this raises the question, Professor, of when you write a constitution, um, in those cases where it worked, what was it that made that constitution actually stick and mean something to the people who would have to live underneath it um, or according to it? 
um, because many of the constitutions in this book fall through. Um, you know, they're there for a year or months or whatever. Um, only a few of them stick around for a long time. Those ones which do, why do they stick around for the time that they do? How do they actually connect with what people are living in their day-to-day lives? Well, I suppose the first point I'd want to make is that constitutions can work in Mm. different ways. Mm. Um, For example, it used to be argued that because most South American constitutions uh, that emerged after the struggles against Spain uh, didn't last very long, This was a sign that they were unimportant, not very good constitutions and so forth. Um, People have pointed out more recently that because these new South American states often had to fight long civil wars and then fight against each other, Mm. very often they had to keep issuing new constitutions either because of regime change or again, because they needed to swell the number of people who, the number of men who would be able to fight in these struggles. And what you therefore get in many South American states in the 19th century is very precocious enfranchisement of indigenous people, Mm. of one-time black slaves, Um, So by the 1850s, South America, much of South America, places like Argentina, they're actually much more democratic than the United States or most of Europe in terms of the different kinds of male people they've enfranchised. Mm. So to that extent, this flurry of constitutions Mm can't be ignored. They may not Mm. last very long, but they do achieve something. Yes. In terms of constitutions that last, um, I think there's different reasons why they can last. In the Norwegian case, it's because it is regularly amended. Um, And I think that's very important as a factor in a constitution's survival. Um, Is it being updated regularly? Mm. I mean, if one thinks of Thomas Jefferson, and Jefferson's Mm. line was that he didn't think a constitution should last more than 17 or 18 years, particularly Mm. in a expanding and innovating place like the United States. And you could argue that one of the reasons why uh, US politics is in such a mess at present is that there have been so few amendments to its federal constitution uh, since about 1980. Uh, And the document is out of date, but because partisan divisions are so acute, there's no way of getting a consensus to amend the constitution. So you're stuck with this document that is revered, um, but is out of date in many Mm. respects. Mm. So uh, amendment can be one reason why a constitution survives uh, and continues to work. Mm. Um, Another reason is is luck um (laughs) you know uh frankly um if your country is grievously defeated in war or if it is invaded or occupied um or there's a major civil war it's likely that the extant constitution will go Mm. um if you avoid those kind of crises the old constitution may linger on. But defeat often leads to new constitutions because there's the feeling the old regime has been um, humiliated by military defeat 
Uh, mm. We really need a, a new document for a new future. Mm. Uh, so that happens in France, which was invaded during the Second World War. It happens in Germany, which was defeated in the Second World War. It happens in Japan, which was also defeated in the Second World War. All these places get new constitutions after the Second World War. Right. So you've got reform. You've got the very practical requirement for manpower. And I mean, literally manpower in, in these cases. Um, and then also luck. I love that idea of, you know, extant circumstances just intervening. And really that, that comes through, I think, when you're writing about the American Civil War, where you say there was a sense that this could have been the end. It, it could have been the end of the experiment of the written constitution. Um, bringing it back to the present day, well, Professor. Well, that, that's what some conservatives wanted to so, Yeah, OK. Yes. So that, that wasn't really the case, do you think? Yeah. Well, I, I think it would have been... Um, quite a blow. Yeah. I think, though, that the Conservatives, you particularly had some British Conservatives saying, oh, we knew that these paper constitutions, <laughs> you know, look at France, that's always having revolutions and having a new constitution. Look at South America. Uh, and then, you know, people have been saying, well, oh, well, but the US Constitution has lasted. But look, it hasn't lasted. It's breaking <laughs> up. Um, clearly, this was a bad idea. Um, yeah. I don't think that was ever likely okay. really right. to happen, but yeah. um, it would certainly have made a difference, I think, to political debates if the yes. US had found it. Yes. See, that's very interesting. So the political imperatives drive the way that we cast the constitutions themselves. Do, I can't help but ask this. Do, do you think that England could ever end up with a written constitution? Yes, I do, because there could be uh, an existential crisis and it yeah. could feasibly happen in the next decade. Um, yeah. If uh, a vote is held in uh, the near future uh, yeah. about Scottish independence and yeah. this time the independence uh, side wins um, the, the vote, uh, then... Uh, unless the two countries want to go to war, Scotland becomes independent. Hmm. Um, what is also quite possibly on the cards is the reunification of Ireland, um, which means that Northern Ireland too would peel off from the UK. And hmm. so all you get left of the UK is England and Wales. Hmm. Um, I think that that shock would probably precipitate some quite structural constitutional change. Um, mm. I'm one of those who think that the only way that such shifts can be avoided anyway is for more programmatic constitutional innovation to be attempted in the UK but it's not going to happen under the current British administration. That's very interesting, yeah. And, and in the case of the United States, because you, you mentioned it before as well, um, obviously there is this cult of the written constitution there, um, as, which you mentioned at the start of this conversation, which drove you in part to explore this topic. Um, what do you think is happening in the United States? Why are we seeing the kind of breakdown, if I can use that word, um, of the constitution there, at least in the way that some members of the... Um, of the American public respect the Constitution as an idea or ideal? Well, I mean, it's, it's not all peculiar to the United States. Mm. Um, I mean, populism is uh, a powerful movement in large parts of the globe. Um, so populist politics, uh, a revulsion against different kinds of elites can disrupt, has disrupted politics um, with constitutional shifts in, you know, think of Hungary um, mm. uh, with the populist leader having just won re-election again and having changed the constitution several times to facilitate his control. So populism operates in the United States too. Um, 
it's also in some ways too large a country. I mean, mm. it's 3,000 miles wide. Um, as in other countries, deference has receded, um, mm. which I suppose is good. And you could argue that, um, you know, the idea that the United States was always going to cohere. Historians have questioned that recently, um, even in 1787, when uh, mm. the United States was very small, the, the guys at Philadelphia had a difficult time getting a constitution that would satisfy the southern states as well as the northern states, the big states as well as the small ones. Um, as the United States has widened, uh, trying to build political consensus there has become even more difficult. You could argue in that respect, had slavery been out of the debate that the United States splitting up mm. into a North and a South would have resolved some issues. But of course, that didn't happen. And it's good that it didn't happen because of slavery. But if you look at the kind of policy preferences of the American South now, as voted by its democratic elections, to the extent they are democratic, and uh, parts of the Midwest. These are very different regions in politics and ideas from the East Coast states, the old American colonies. Mm. Understandably, they, they've got different democratic, demo, demographic structures, different histories, um, different religious patterns, different mm. ethnic patterns. And how you keep all that together. Mm. And I suppose one of the challenges that is involved here is a bigger challenge. What do you do with written constitutions? How do they keep their influence at a time mm. when political information is being balkanized all the time, partly because of the web? Um, mm. I mean, most people don't read mm. their nation's constitution. <laughs> uh, that isn't new. But what's new or newer is that they're getting political information from so many different sources now, not from the big newspapers, not from a recognized big TV channel necessarily. Um, they go on the web. They find their own kind of political analysis that they like. Um, and so there's been a fragmentation mm. of political information and how the idea of a iconic national constitution, how that old idea can be made to sit with the new technologies seems to me to yeah. be a very big question. That's fascinating because it is a clash of technology, isn't it? This old paper creation <laughs> against the proliferation of this exponential big tech um, machine and, 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 you know, various media sources. Do you still have faith, Professor, then that the written constitution will survive? Because obviously, you know, we're living through a, a momentous time right now with Russia and Ukraine. Um, you end your book on a moving instance um, of a pro-democracy activist, a young woman in 2019, standing up to um, armed guards in Russia and holding you know, forward and reading, I think, from the Russian constitution. It, that suggests that there is a kind of spirit that some constitutions can have um, where they have a power beyond the law. Um, you know, this was something that Montesquieu spoke about and also Burke too and others as well. Do you still have faith that that spirit can survive? Um, in, 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 in face of all of these massive changes that you just detailed? 
I think it can survive. I think it should survive. Um, like most historians, I'm sort of split between the cynicism that goes with our profession in some ways and, um, you know, <laughs> hopes for humankind, if you like. Um, because it is the case, actually, that in 2020, the Russian constitution was amended and one of, partly to enhance Putin's authority, mm. but one of the alterations to the text made in 2020 to the Russian constitution was about Russia's um, commitment to international peace and harmony, um, <laughs> which, you know, um, may make you question uh, what these documents are. Um, they, they are the creation of fallible, often corrupt human beings. Mm. Um, so that's the point. I think in some contexts, they can be very important. Going back to what I said earlier, if Scotland becomes independent, um, the Scottish Nationalist Party has said it wants a codified constitution. Mm. And one can see in that case, the creation of a new country. Um, a constitution will serve a very important and hopefully durable purpose. And I would have thought with these current appalling troubles in Ukraine, that new constitutions may emerge from them for mm. good, hopefully, but possibly for bad. If Putin succeeds in taking over large parts of Ukraine, um, he is likely to impose a new constitution uh, on his conquests, yeah. that would likely be bad. Um, it's within the bounds of possibility, though, that if this results in humiliation and disaster for Russia, that Putin will fall, mm. in which case, if he is replaced by, um, and I'm being very optimistic here, if he's replaced by a more liberal regime or just a different regime, mm. that different regime might want to create a new Russian constitution. Again, mm. to say, we are not the country that we were. Mm. Um, we are looking to the future. This is the new script. Mm. And this possibility of providing a new script seems to me what a constitution can be very valuable for. Um, as in um, the, the South African constitution created in the 1990s, the first post-apartheid constitution, whether people read it or not, mm -hmm. that clearly was a very important statement uh, that needed to be made. Mm. Yeah, I guess if we know anything, it's that we're not exempt from the same kind of historical pressures or circumstances that your book explores now. Um, <laughs> and that's, you know, and that, and that, that says something about its, its, its relevance and the relevance of this history, particularly for this moment we are in. So, Professor, we, we've hit our time limit, but thank you so much for this conversation. It's been extraordinary and fascinating. And, um, you know, I admire you so much as an historian and writer. And particularly this book's clarity is just incredible. <laughs> um, and, you know, one wonders how you put it together in the way that you did. But thank you so much for taking the time to speak it with me. It took a, a long honor. time. And I would yeah. like to do it again. Yes. It was, I'm it's sure been, it was worth it. <laughs> but thank you so much. It's been a great pleasure talking to you. Thank you so much.